My name is Lindsay and I'm the owner of Back by Design Co. Thank you so much for joining me on this beautiful weekend for the virtual wood show. I can't wait to teach you all about epoxy art overlays for beginners. I really hope you guys enjoy this workshop. If you have any questions at all, please put them in the chat box and I'm going to do my best to answer them at the end for you. You ready to get started? Let's go. So these pieces aren't quite finished yet, but I just wanted to give you a little sneak peek at what we're going to be doing today. Now, before we get started, I wanna to talk to you about safety and personal protective equipment. Always work with epoxy in a well-ventilated area. I don't suggest pouring epoxy inside your home. Whenever I work with epoxy, I'm working in a ventilated clean room. I have an exhaust, I have incoming fresh air, and then I also have an air cleaner inside my room. In addition to that, I also wear a full face respirator, or if you don't plan to work with epoxy that often, you can also wear a half respirator and a pair of goggles. The most important thing with this is that they are NIOSH approved. The cartridges I use are organic vapor cartridges, and because I do sand epoxy, I also have P100 filters for them as well. So that's the mask out of the way. One thing I just wanted to add very quickly, because I know somebody's going to ask, what if my epoxy is low or no VOCs? Do I still need to wear a respirator? I do still recommend wearing a respirator. Anytime you're using a heat gun or a torch, uh, with your epoxy artwork, you are changing the chemical composition of the epoxy and it can or will release noxious vapors. So always wear your respirator, work in a well-ventilated area, very important, can't stress that enough. I like to work with a good quality nitrile glove. Nitrile is more chemically resistant than latex, so that's why I always use these whenever I'm working with epoxy. Despite being careful, if you should happen to get epoxy on your skin, please don't use vinegar, alcohol, acetone, or any other solvents to remove it. Get yourself something similar to this Gojo Natural Orange Hand Cleaner. Dry wash your hands or your skin to remove the epoxy, and then wash and dry with soap and water as normal, and that'll take it off your skin safely. As well, if your heat gun does get extremely hot very quickly, I always like to keep a scrap block of wood nearby or a piece of steel works really well as well. Uh, keep it away from your skin. Be mindful of where you're where you're putting it down, especially with these plastic drop sheets and things like that. You never want to direct the heat gun directly at your plastic because it can melt quite quickly. Uh, so just always be mindful of where you're directing the air from your heat gun and always be very mindful uh, of where you're putting it down whenever it's not in use. Like I said, uh, just a spare block of wood comes in handy. I like to rely on the built-in stands. Many of them have either a built-in stand into the back of the handle or into the back of the gun itself but i don't like to trust these myself because i know i will knock it over so um, i do recommend getting yourself a little block of wood and that's going to be your trusty little stand this is my torch of preference you don't need to use a torch this large you can also use a small butane torch the purpose of the torch is just to pop the surface bubbles so once we get the artwork on there, you never want to direct your flame directly at the piece down at the epoxy. You're just going to raise the surface to pop any surface bubbles. So I'll show you another angle of that once we get started. Be mindful of your flame, open flame, hot nozzle on your heat gun. Just keep that in mind. We always want to be safe um, when, whenever we're working with epoxy. So this beautiful piece of walnut is actually the one that we are working on today. So I have squared up both ends and I have rounded them off with a half inch round over bit with my router table. I also have removed the bark with my um, draw knife that I got from Lee Valley Tools. After that, I sanded the entire piece over with 120 grit using my Festool Orbital Sander. And then I also went over it again at 150 grit. So you wanna make sure that the piece that you're working on is raw wood, that it doesn't have any oils or waxes applied. That'll give you the best results for your epoxy art. I also recommend working with kiln dried wood. Um, then you have no risk of bugs or, uh, and the wood will be a lot more stable whenever it's been kiln dried versus um, you know, using fresh wood or green wood. So these are just some of the supplies that you're going to need today if you want to follow along. Today I'm using Chill Epoxy's Chill 3D. It's made by Polymer Technologies. There's so many different types of epoxy, so it's so important to make sure you're working with the right product for your application. Whenever you're doing epoxy art overlays like this one, you'll want to use a high viscosity one-to-one -one tabletop or artwork epoxy. So this type of epoxy is specifically engineered to be used as a coating or overlay epoxy, used at a depth of approximately one eighth to one quarter inch. The difference between that and a casting epoxy is a casting epoxy is, has a longer pot life typically and it also has a longer cure time. So it has a chance for all those bubbles to release whenever you're working with higher volume pours. So this epoxy is made generally for lower volume pours, 
less volume and less depth. So this again is just more for overlay or coating, whereas a two to one or casting epoxy is made for deeper pores uh, whenever you're filling a mold or um, say doing an epoxy river table. So the other thing I want you to consider whenever you're selecting your epoxy is your pot life and your cure time. So most tabletop epoxies have a pot life of 30 to 60 minutes and they set in approximately 24 to 48 hours in a working ambient temperature of 20 to 24 degrees. So Chill 3D that we're using today has a pot life of 60 minutes. So this means you have approximately one hour to work with the mixed epoxy before it begins to kick and is no longer workable. So you should plan it to finish approximately three quarters of the time available in your pot life to allow for any fixes and other variables. The other very important thing I really wanted to mention, if you choose to take up epoxy, whether it's as a business, a side hustle, or a hobby, please consider your impact on the environment. Use reusable plastic or silicone supplies whenever possible. I'll amount to work on one board, so we're gonna be using the little cups that are in the front. Um, and they are reusable, like I said, once the epoxy is cured, the cup is flexible so you can give it a squeeze and you can very easily remove the epoxy from the cup. The thing about epoxy is that the pot life, the setting and the cure times, they're not set in stone either, and some people find this to be one of the most intimidating things about working with epoxy. Many things can affect the epoxy, including the temperature of your working environment, not only during pouring, but while curing, the temperature of the resin and the hardener itself, the type and amount of pigments or additives that you've used, you also need to be really precise in your measurements. So be sure to check whether your epoxy should be mixed by weight or by volume. It's also extremely important to properly mix part A and part B together to create a homogenous mixture. If the mixture isn't mixed properly, it can't react and inadequate mixing and measuring is honestly probably the number one reason that people get unsatisfactory results whenever they're working with epoxies. The thing to consider is that you'll want to use all of the mixed epoxy within the time frame of your pot life and also you shouldn't leave large volumes of epoxy sitting in your cup as they can quickly heat up and melt it. Now with all that out of the way, let's talk about the rest of the supplies that you're going to need to get started. So we already talked about our epoxy. We're also gonna to wanna to make sure that we have a level on hand and you wanna use an appropriate size level for the piece that you're working on. If you were working on a large table, you would wanna make sure that you have a larger four, two foot, eight foot level, for example. Um, today, we're just using this 12 inch level. We also wanna make sure that we have some blue painter's tape on hand. We are going to tape the bottom of our piece and I'm gonna show you how to tape and easily remove drips after you've cured your epoxy art. We're also going to use a timer and the timer is just going to help us keep in line with our pot life. You also need something to stir your epoxy with. My favorite to use is silicone, but because I'm using smaller containers for the workshop today, I'm actually going to be using wooden popsicle sticks. You also need to get yourself some plastic mixing cups. I prefer ones that have flat smooth sides and also a flat smooth bottom. It makes it much easier to get a homogenous mixture whenever you're mixing your resin and your hardener together. These ones are also flexible, so you'll be able to leave a little bit of epoxy in the bottom if you need it, just a teeny tiny little bit with a stick, give it a squeeze, and then also pull out the hardened resin and then reuse this container when you're done. With so many different additives, I find it to be overwhelming for most people who are just starting out on what they should use for their desired effects. I'm actually here to tell you that you can use any of these products to dye or tint your epoxy. Uh, these are my favorite, the Chill Drops, the White Opaque by Polymer Technologies and Ecopoxy's White Color Pigment. They're very concentrated. You can use these not only for your artwork, but in furniture pieces as well. So those are my two go-tos. I've tried all of these products in the white on the right-hand side, and I've had success creating cells with all of them. So if you have something laying around, don't, I mean, you can try it before you give something else a purchase but these are definitely my favorite. So if you are struggling to get those cells, definitely give these a try. Polymer Technologies and Ecopoxy's white color pigments. They're both opaque and they're highly, highly concentrated. These painter's triangles are super helpful to prop your piece up. The epoxy will just pop off it once it's cured. If your piece is really heavy or it's soft wood, instead you can use these plastic shot glasses. It, then you don't have to risk leaving little dents uh, from the points of the pyramids in your piece. We talked a little bit about a heat gun. You don't need to spend a lot on one. It can be helpful if they have adjustable fan speeds and temperatures, but the best ones in my opinion are those that are between 12 and 20 CFM. And you also don't need the nozzle attachments, but some people like them or prefer them to get different techniques, but I don't personally use them. So this is a torch that I like to use. Again, you don't have to use one this large. You can use a small butane torch. I just like this one because I'm typically working on tables or on large batches at once. Okay, so now we're gonna tape our piece. I like to tape the ends. As I said, I've used a roundover bit on the top 
sorry, a half inch round over bit on the top and the bottom, and I've sanded the piece all over. So you don't want your tape to run down the curve. As soon as your piece starts to go flat, you just wanna leave maybe a millimeter space and then put your tape on. You wanna make sure you press it down really well because you don't want any epoxy to seep underneath. So don't worry about the ends hanging out. I usually just trim those all at the end. Whenever you're trying to tape a live edge, of course, it's not gonna be as easy to tape as the straight ones, but I like to just push down maybe two inches or so of tape at a time before I move along to the next section. That way it doesn't pull up. And I don't even worry about pushing the whole piece of tape down because I find sometimes it puts some weird tensions on the tape. So I just like to put it down, make sure there's no folds in it, and I get as close to that edge as I possibly can. Just a little bit too much there, but that's okay. We're gonna trim all that off. So I just go around where the corners meet up and trim off the excess. So just in case I get any questions about the type of tape, these are three brands that I have used and work pretty well. Beauty Tone and 3M, the Scotch Blue Painter's Tape are my favorite, but this uh, X-Fasten tape that I got from Amazon, it works as well in a pinch. Okay, so I have equal parts of my resin and my hardener mixed out. I have three ounces of each. I recommend using between three to five ounces per square foot, depending on the thickness. And also depending on the porosity of the piece, if the piece is spalted maple, it's really soft, it of course is going to absorb a lot more epoxy than a piece of solid black walnut wood. So those are things that you'll gain with experience, but I can let you know that it's generally between three to five ounces per square foot. All right, let's get into pouring. So we are going to mix our resin and our hardener. Again, we have three ounces of each. We're gonna mix those together into a separate cup. We're gonna stir them really well, scraping the sides, scraping the bottom giving it a good vigorous stir, but we wanna try not to whip it like pancake mix. We don't wanna to whip too many unnecessary bubbles in there. We do wanna stir vigorously and we do wanna stir for several minutes to make sure we get a nice homogenous mixture. Okay, so we have our third cup. So we are, I like to put my hardener, which is the lower viscosity or the thinner of the two products. I like to start with that. So even at this por portion, you wanna make sure you get every last drop out of your cup. You wanna scrape the sides really well, let it drain and drip from the bottom and of course you want to be really careful don't mix your epoxy over top of the piece you're working on definitely don't do that I like to have a little section mixed up where I have some plastic drop sheets laid down that way if I do get any drips the thing about getting a drips out of hardener or resin on their own is that they're not going to harden over over any period of time. They need to be mixed together for that reaction to occur. So if I was to spill hardener all over my piece, that'd be extremely unfortunate right now. <laughs> it's in our resin. Same thing, scrape the sides, scrape the bottom really well, letting it drain. It's a little bit cold in my shop this morning, uh, despite the beautiful weather. <laughs> it's about 15 degrees in here. Uh, so I have a little baseboard heater in my clean room. So I have just turned that on. So. Of course, the epoxy gets a little bit cooler overnight. Once you're confident that you've got every last drop out of your cups, you're going to begin mixing your resin hardener together. So when you first mix it, if you look at it, you can see they both started clear. And as soon as you start to mix it, they kind of get these cloudy little bands. So that is how you know that your epoxy is not mixed well together. Essentially, when you're done, you want it to be clear again. But as soon as you started mixing them, that exothermic process has begun. So see how cloudy it is now? Some bubbles in there. It's got a really stringy texture. Hopefully you can see that. Very cloudy, but we're gonna keep stirring for a few minutes. We can set our timer at this point. If you need it, um, you can use your phone if you don't have a timer nearby. For a small amount of epoxy like this, maybe three to four minutes would be plenty. Oh, we're out of focus, sorry guys. Uh, three to five minutes would be plenty for this amount of epoxy. The larger the volume of epoxy that you're mixing, the longer you'll need to stir it for it to get a nice homogenous mixture. So I'm gonna keep stirring and we'll see you in it back in a minute. to show you this piece of black wall it's a little bit heavier so I'm using these shot glasses these plastic shot glasses to prop it up but you can also use these feet pyramids to prop up your piece but that's super helpful 
And finally, don't forget before you do start pouring to level out your piece and just make sure that the bubble's in the center in both directions. That way you know you're not gonna lose all your epoxy on your piece as it cures. Okay, so we have our batch of mixed epoxy. We have a couple extra cups here, depending on how many colors we wanna use. Today, I'm gonna to use two different blue colors and I'm also gonna use white and clear. So we're gonna use a few cups today. Like I said, can't stress it enough. These are single disposable use cups. You can clean the epoxy out of these, but it's much better to use silicone or those other style cups that I showed you where you can clean the epoxy out of those and reuse them. We are going to start. I'm just gonna use this teeny tiny little one for the white because we don't really need a lot. So we're gonna start with that. Okay, so now our epoxy's mixed, our piece is propped up on our pyramids. We've leveled it to make sure that it's level in both directions. We're now ready to get mixing our pigment colors. So as you can see, I've separated the epoxy out into a couple different cups. This one's gonna be our white. We just need a little bit for clear. A light blue, I have a tiny little bit here because I think I'm gonna have some leftovers. And then I'm gonna use two different color blues and maybe I'll even use a metallic blue. So we're just gonna get mixed in our pigments. I'm using Eco Epoxy's metallic mica powder pigment. So this is in the color Maui. So we're gonna be using that as our metallic. I'm using Chill Drops white opaque pigments. That's gonna be our white foamy shore. And then I'm using this combination of Eco Epoxy's blue pigment and their green pigment to make my two blue colors. I encourage you to play around with different colors, looking at different color reels, how to combine different colors. Um, be cautious of mixing different pigments together. Sometimes you can definitely do that with success, but sometimes it will change the curing time and the pot light and will generally speed things up. Acrylic paint is the cheapest type of pigment to use. However, in my opinion, it's probably also the lowest quality pigment when it comes to epoxy. You need such high ratios, I find, to get a good concentrated color where you need just small amounts of a, for example, a resin pigment. So I always recommend spending a little bit more. I've got my timer set so I keep on track, especially today while I'm filming. So get a really good mixture whenever you're mixing your pigments as well, because if not, you're going to get uneven color. You only need a tiny, just start with a tiny, tiny little bit when it comes to micas or resin pigments. Five to 10% is the maximum, but you should always start on the lower end of that because of course you can't remove it, but you can always add more pigment if needed. So this is that gorgeous Maui blue mica powder. I don't know if you can see that in the camera, but it has some really cool effects. And this is where most people start, I think, when they're trying to get their ocean effects. I think they start with a mica powder. They're always surprised by the transparency of it. So mica powders are quite transparent. So I'm gonna show you how to get a nice concentrated so you don't see any show through on your wood on the sides. So if you do wanna have some show through, then of course you're just gonna use less pigment. So we're actually gonna start with our clear and I'm just gonna select a line and I'm going to lay it down. So this is exactly where my final line of my artwork is gonna be, where it transitions to the wood. So keep in mind, depending on how thick you lay it out, it is going to spread pieces of figure because I really like to show the natural beauty of the wood. I start a little bit in from the sides. I don't ever like to just start pouring and that's because otherwise you'll get a lot of waste. So once I kind of get my line figured out then I'll go back in and I'll start just filling it and making it a little bit thicker. And as you get towards the end of your cup then you can kind of start working towards the outsides to let that flow over naturally over the edge. When it comes to doing the clear, I always like to leave this part a little bit thicker than I would the others and just let it naturally self-level as opposed to pushing it around. And that's just because you want to have some excess epoxy to let the white pigment push over the rest of the colors. And you'll see that in a minute. Sometimes if you get spots of unmixed epoxy, it can be because you've scraped the actual cup itself at the very end of your project. I've never had an issue with this personally. Like I said, the epoxies I use are actually quite forgiving. I use Eco Epoxy and I use Polymer Technologies and I find them, I've never had any issues with curing ever since I started working with epoxy actually. So uh, if you are having issues, it could be your epoxy, it could be your mix and it could just be how long you're mixing it for. So those are all a few things that you can check out. Okay, so we've got our clear down. So now we're gonna go back in and we're gonna do the lightest blue color. And we're just gonna follow that natural line. You can make it curvy if you want. You can do whatever you want. You can go back in and manipulate it with your hands after.
And then the rest of it, I like to do all of this with my hands. I like to go back in and I like to put the epoxy exactly where I want it. I try to keep one clean gloved hand, that way I can use it to stabilize my piece. And this part is as little or as much hand mixing as you want. If you want to get a nice cool ombre effect, you can really get in there with your hands and mix it. If you don't want to have too much mixture of your colors, then you start with your lightest color and, and you can either use a stick or your hands and then you just kind of mix it as much or as little as you want as you get towards the end. So I, on this particular piece, I'm going for a real stormy look. So we're just going to get in there with our hands and then we're, we can go back in and finalize any little details with some of our extra epoxy at the end. So this is really important, making sure you get a really good coating on the sides. And also not only that, but sort of tucking your fingers under the edge of your piece to make sure that you're meeting up the epoxy right up to the tape. And that will encourage the epoxy to want to flow over the tape and then cause the drips to land on top of the tape. And that makes it easier for them to remove. Okay, so we've got a pretty good mix. It doesn't look like much yet, and I promise it will, once we get the heat gun to it. If you wanna help the product self-level itself, the tapping motion with your fingers can really help to release the surface tension, especially on the edges, and that just helps everything to naturally kind of flow over. And then you can go back in with any of your micas or any of your translucent, even in the same layer. You can go back and do them in the second layer if you want, but sometimes I really like to add some depth and do a lot of things in one layer. So this, I'm not gonna to push too hard into the other pigments that are below. I'm just gonna let it more or less sit on the surface. So what really causes the different cells and the effects in epoxy is actually the different densities of the different epoxies. And what causes the different densities, if you were to put clear on clear, nothing's gonna happen, obviously. But if you were to take a pigment and add it to the clear, then you start to get some really cool effects because it, now one of the pigments that you're using, for example, white with the clear, one of them's a lot heavier than the other. So when you cause, when you blow it over one, using heat or air, then it allows all those micro bubbles to come up and pop to the surface and then really helps to create those cells as well as forcing the lighter pigment to the top and the heavier one to the bottom. Even coverage, make sure it's not too thin, it's not too thick. If it's too thick, you saw me rub it in quite a bit and try to pat it out to level it. If it's too thick, what you see is not necessarily what it's going to look like once it cures. So the more product you have on there, it's going to force itself to run off the sides and it's really going to spread out whatever you've created on your board. So I really like to keep the, the layers to that one eighth of an inch as much as I possibly can. And now we're getting into the real fun part. Is we're going to take our white pigment, mix it really, really well, give it a good final stir because it has been sitting for a minute. And then we're just, I just want you to get used to it first, getting a nice controlled stream coming off your stick. You can pour this directly from the cup as well, if you like, but I prefer to use my stick. I think I have a little bit more control over it. And then I like to just stick as close as possible to that transition line where the clear meets the wood. If you use a lot of white pigment, this stuff is highly, highly concentrated. So you will get a lot of spread on the white. And if you want to keep it more to the shoreline, then you're just going to use a lot less. So when I first started, I used to make all of my pieces using one layer. Now I like to add a lot more dimension. So I actually will typically do maybe anywhere from between two to four layers just to add dimension. And it also depends on the size of the piece. So sometimes I'm a little less worried about the first layer. So if you do have a mistake, don't toss it. Don't, don't think, oh no, it's messed up. You just go in and just add another layer the next day. Okay, so now we're ready for the fun part to use our heat gun. So we're gonna start with the heat gun on the lower setting and then if you need to turn it up, you can do that. You don't wanna direct your heat gun straight down at your piece and you also don't wanna direct it at a straight perpendicular angle either. You wanna sort of go in a bit of a sweeping motion keeping a couple inches away and pulling, so pushing it forward and gently pulling back your hand. And the reason for this is if you stay on it too long and just hold and push all the pigment where you want it immediately, 
By the time you're done, you're going to have heated up your epoxy so much that it's going to continuously bubble and you're just going to have a bit of a nightmare. So I always recommend less is more. Start out, just go really slow. It takes a while, I promise you, uh, to get the kind of hang of the motion that you need to do. But once you get it, you got it. This is my style. I really like to keep a nice defined um, controlled shoreline. You can blow your waves all the way to the back of the piece if you want. You just need to add more pigment. You need to gently just work at it and push it. I love this technique. I love to do it so it looks like an aerial view from the sky. If you prefer to blow your white across the back of your piece so that you get cells across your whole piece, you can absolutely do that. It's a different scale effect. It looks more like a close-up piece. Both really cool effect affects really cool techniques and it just comes down to your preference. So I'm really happy with how that turned out for a first layer, that's awesome. A couple other tips I wanted to give you, if you are working, so right now I'm working on a table where I have sort of 360 degree access around my piece, but if you're not and you're working on a bench, I definitely recommend getting something like a mirror that you can lean up against the back wall that you're working on that way without if you can't get around the back of your piece you can kind of see what's going on back there make sure you've put enough epoxy and that you've got under that lip and that there's no wood show through you guys enjoy so that's the first portion of it we're going to let this sit for about five minutes and then we're going to torch it with our torch and just get all the surface micro bubbles popped so see this little section here so that's what i was talking about some pieces you get a little bit of soak in so you can wait about a half an hour, you can touch up that spot. I'm not gonna to be too worried about it because I know I'm gonna go in and do a second layer on this piece, but it's still important to torch. Just gently torching the bubbles. So again, you don't wanna direct your flame directly at your piece. When you do it, you're going at, a, at an angle here and you're just skimming the surface. So that's it guys, it's that easy. So I hope you have been inspired and I hope you wanna try it too. These cells truly are effortless if you're using high quality pigments. I did give it a, dry, a try, I would love it if you would tag me because I can't wait to see your creations. So we're gonna move on to the last part which is when your piece is cured for 48 to 72 hours, how you're going to finish it. Okay, so now your artwork on your piece is done and you're wondering how to finish it. So obviously this is a different piece but it has been curing for at least 72 hours. So now I'm gonna flip it over and I'm gonna show you how to deal with the drips on the back. Okay, so just be mindful of where you're putting your piece down, of course, at this point, until the epoxy is fully cured after sometimes um, a few weeks or even a month, you wanna be very careful. The epoxy is still soft at this point, so just always put it down on a soft surface anytime you have to put it artwork face down. If I was to put this directly on my wood bench, it would definitely be scratched when I turned it over. So even though it's on a soft surface, you still wanna be careful. Make sure you use your air compressor to blow off any small pieces of wood or even epoxy from your previous sandings. Then we're gonna take our same trusty heat gun and wanna point the heat directly at the sides of your artwork. You always wanna point it away from your piece. Just be mindful you're not directing it at the mat itself. I even like to overhang my piece slightly when I'm working on each side. Depending on your heat gun, what the CFM is and what the temperature, it's gonna be a little bit different for everybody, but what you're gonna do is heat it up just a section at a time, not holding it for too long. If your tape is smoking or your epoxy is smoking, you're holding it for too long. Please make sure you wear your respirator during this point. This is very important. Um, you will notice some definitely noxious vapors from doing this. So I'm gonna put my mask on and I'm gonna go ahead and do this. Like I said, you wanna do small sections at a time. If I was to try to heat this whole piece, it wouldn't stay warm enough for me to be able to pull the tape off decently. So I'm just working in small, maybe four to six inch sections at a time. 
And like I said, it'll take a little bit of experimenting to see how long you need to hold your heat gun for for this to be efficient. But just gently start pulling it back. If there's any tension, it's ripping the tape, then you wanna make sure you heat it up a little bit more, but it should effortlessly just peel those strips back. If you have a little scraper tool, it can be helpful just to heat up any last little bits of epoxy at the end. So I'm using my Fest tool orbital sander today, but you can obviously use any orbital sander. I like to start with an older pad because I know it's going to be a little bit ruined from the epoxy when I'm done. And then, like I said, I'm starting at 120 and I'm just going to focus on the edges just to get that epoxy out. Another thing I wanted to mention, whenever you have to go at the drips, it's a good idea. If you see the holes, these are designed for dust extraction. So if you go at the drips straight down, you're very likely to tear the paper up. So I like to start using this edge of the pad and just go at them on an angle just to take off the sharp edges of the drips. And then I can go in like normal. So now we have 220 grit on our orbital sander and we're just going to sand it so the back is nice and even. ready for oil. So I like to keep this rubber mat underneath just so that I know it's not going to scratch anything. And then I like to use this 24 inch craft paper. This is what I do all my finishing on. So before I get started, I'd like to use a little bit of compressed air just to blow off the dust off the surface of the artwork. So when I'm finishing my boards, I like to use Osmo top oil. We're going to apply a thin coat with this little piece of a 3M fine hand pad that I've cut and then we're gonna buff it off with a clean, lint-free white rag. So give it a shake. You can tell as soon as you put that on how rich the wood gets. Well, that's so beautiful. One of my favorite woods. I love spalted maple as well. Really my passion started in woodworking and then very quickly uh, I started to experiment with epoxy. And I promise you, if you haven't already, it's very addicting. <laughs> But I, I hope I've inspired you. I hope you, uh, like I said, decide that you want to create something. And if you do, I hope you'll tag me because I really can't wait to see what you guys come up with. So whenever you're doing this, you don't need a ton. You don't need to have it dripping. I just like to really work it into the wood. So I'll show you an example here. So if I was just to maybe go back and forth over the wood, I'm putting moderate pressure. But see how it's missing spots? I really like to go in circles or in eights. I find you get a lot better coverage and it makes sure that it pushes the finish into every pore of the wood. So I'm gonna do the top, the sides, and the end. I'm not going to put any finish on the epoxy art, but I am gonna make sure that I go right up to that line. And don't worry if you do get a little bit on, because we can always buff that off at the end. Okay, so now that we've got the finish applied over the whole sides, and the ends of our piece. Just take a really good look at it in another angle of light. Just make sure you haven't missed anywhere. Don't forget to wear gloves when you do this. Depending on your wood species, if you're working with softwoods it, or even spalted maples, it really will want to absorb the finish. So it's okay to go back and hit it a few times. If you're working on large pieces or a table, you can also use a polisher or something larger mechanical to be able to do finish a lot quicker.
But because it's just one piece that I'm doing to show you, I'm just gonna do it by hand. The thing is if you don't put on too much excess, you don't have too much to buff off either and you don't go through a lot of rags, start soaking rags with excess wasteful finish. So it's another good tip as well. Now you're gonna buff it off, all the excess. It's important when using this finish that when you're finished with it, you have soaking wet rags and cloths with finish on them that you don't bundle them up and put them into um, you know, your garbage or into um, a bag or anything like that because they actually can spontaneously combust. It's never happened to me luckily, um, but some people will have like a steel garbage can or something that they'll put them in. I personally like to hang them up and let them air dry individually and then I'll throw them in the garbage after that. Or I'll use them for dirty shop rags sometimes. Oil changes, you know. Okay, so now that that's buffed off, we're gonna flip it over. I'm just gonna give one final buff on the top and the sides, make sure we have no fingerprints on it. And then from this point on, we are not gonna touch the wood with our gloved hands. We are only gonna use a clean rag we're gonna take our brand new clean soft rag and we're gonna, I'm actually gonna take my glove off at this point and I'm just gonna buff the line where I may have got some finish on my artwork. And that's it. Last thing you're gonna to wanna to do is either grab your plastic cups or your yellow triangles. Again, make sure they don't have any wet epoxy on them and then you're just gonna prop up your piece. Remember not to use your bare hands because you will get oil marks. And I always like to use at least four. So that's it guys, that's all there is to it. After you've applied your finish, buffed it off, buffed your epoxy, then you're gonna prop your piece up on some paint pyramids. You're gonna let that dry for eight to 12 hours and then you're gonna go, if you like, and do a second coat the exact same way. Well, that is it for me today, guys. Thank you so much for joining me. It was a pleasure to be here. I hope you had as much fun as I did. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Backwood Design Co. to follow along with my work. And you can also follow me on YouTube if you're looking for more tutorials like this one. Thanks so much, guys. And thank you so much to the Virtual Wood Show for having me. It was an honor to be here. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, guys.